Earlier this week, the headlines told us that one out of five young people in the UK feel that life is not worth living. This is double the figure of a decade ago. Mental health statistics in the US tell an equally bleak story. Children born after 1994 have much higher rates of mental illness than the previous generation. This isn't just about their willingness to talk about their difficulties. It's evident in their behavior too, particularly in the rising rates of hospitalization for teenage girls who are deliberately self-harming. What can we do to reverse these trends? Can we help children better cope with life's challenges? As a psychotherapist, I often get calls from parents asking me to stop a particular behavior. Sometimes it's cutting or food restriction or drugs. What the parents don't always realize is these behaviors are the young person's attempt to feel better or at least not feel so bad. Their symptom is their solution. But what's the problem? In my view, it's regulating their emotions. Early in my career, I worked with a 15-year-old boy who was binging and vomiting. And every week, he would come in and tell me about his symptoms. And every week, I would propose a new strategy. And he would come back the next week and say, it didn't work. And this went on week after week until finally, I had to state the obvious. I wasn't helping him. And I was dreading this conversation, imagining how let down he'd feel. Instead, it was the opposite. He was elated. He said, I actually don't want to stop. I just wanted to say I'd tried things. I, I really like doing this. It makes me feel better. Now, this boy was filled up with feeling. Vomiting gave him the physical sensation of being empty. But it wasn't food he needed to evacuate. It was his mixed up feelings. We can't expect to resolve symptoms if we don't address the underlying cause. Let's not wait until our children are unwell to address their, their emotions, their feelings. Children are born with varying degrees of sensitivity. It's not very scientific, but I like to think of them as tennis balls or eggs. The tennis balls kind of bounce along, dealing with what life sends their way, but the eggs, they're more sensitive. They require more care. They make great adults, by the way, once they learn to deal with their sensitivity. But when a sensitive child is confronted with an invalidating or hostile environment, you might not find it invalidating, but they do. A critical eyebrow, a difficult friend situation. It can be like an allergic reaction. They're overwhelmed with emotion and flooded with feeling. And in those moments, it's very hard to come up with helpful adaptive solutions for coping. Now, central to developing these helpful adaptive solutions is creating a space, a space between feeling and action. This isn't a new idea. In fact, Epictetus, a Greek-born slave in the first century, describes it really well. He says, or said, try not to act in the moment. Pull back from the situation. Take a wider view. Compose yourself. As a parent, you are absolutely critical in helping your children create this space, a space to say, how do I feel? What could I do now? Now, the first step in creating the space is being able to identify feelings. Neuroscientist Dan Siegel says, name it to tame it. Model naming and acknowledging your own feelings so that your children begin to learn the language of feelings and can do the same. Don't say you're fine when everyone knows you're not. Think of all the sentences you can begin with, I feel. I feel sad because my friend is ill. I feel frustrated because my boss didn't like my report. I feel annoyed because my sister canceled on me. Show your children that it's normal and helpful to talk about feelings. Resist the temptation to join the happiness cult that many parents are creating for their children. Positive and negative emotions are a normal part of everyday life for everyone. No life worth living is without frustration. And tolerating frustration takes practice. Let your children learn to deal with their negative emotions by actually having the chance to experience them. Last week, one of the moms I work with came in and told me how she'd handled some upset with her eight-year-old daughter the day before. Her daughter, let's call her Mindy, came home from school 
crying and shouting because she hadn't been invited to a school friend's party, birthday party. She said, I hate her. It's not fair. I hope her house burns down. And mother described feeling absolutely overwhelmed by the force of her daughter's emotions to the point where mother's eyes filled with tears. Mother said to me she could only calm herself down when she'd contacted the head teacher, who agreed with mom. This was very unkind behavior. And in future, children who didn't invite everyone in the class to their parties would not be able to hand out their invitations at school. Now, I get why a school has this policy. It's kind. It's good to be inclusive. But did mom's intervention do anything to help Mindy? Did it help her deal with future feelings like this? What it did was it showed Mindy that mom was on her side. It didn't help her tolerate her distress. It, it, helped, it showed her that mom was taking action. It wasn't a good long-term strategy. Maybe a short-term win, Mindy stopped crying. Mom felt good because she'd done something. But not a great long-term strategy. We have to model emotional tolerance ourselves so that when our children are confronted with a world that can feel unfair and unreasonable, they know they can cope. When it comes to feelings, your job as a parent is listening, accepting, empathizing, and validating. Of course, there may be times when you have to do more, but listening and empathy go a long way in activating children's problem-solving skills. Mother could have said, oh, how disappointing. Oh, it's so painful to feel left out. This might have helped Mindy accept what she was feeling and make some decisions for herself. If mother can take Mindy's feelings in stride, it sends the message, this is a hiccup, not a catastrophe. We all know what it's like to have the experience of someone missing the chance to really understand us by acknowledging our feelings. How many times have you talked to a friend and told them about a problem and they say, oh my god, I know what you mean, and they're off and running, talking about themselves. <laughs> or they try to tell you what you should do, give you direct advice. You should just quit that job. You've never liked that boss. Or even worse, try to deny your feelings. Oh, I'm sure you didn't feel that way. You probably felt this way. If your child trusts you enough to tell you what they're feeling, don't try to talk them out of it. Beware the language of you should. Now, once children are actively able to name their feelings, the next step is coping with feelings. This step is about the language of I could. I could squeeze and release my muscles. I could count to 10. I could take deep breaths. I could have a snack. I could go for a run. I could talk with a teacher. Different things work for different people. And you can hear they're not unusual, unique strategies you've never heard of. But the key is that you and your child think together about what might work for them. Different things, as I say, work for different people. I worked with a little boy a few years ago who was 10. And he was referred by his school for violent behavior. He said to me in the first appointment that if anyone laughed at him, he felt absolutely outraged. And a lot of people laughed at him because he had this really eccentric sense of style. He, would, uh, he wore cowboy boots and funny hats. And in the first session, he also said to me, look, Cynthia, I know I'm an oddball, but it really annoys me if people act like I'm an oddball. So we came up with a strategy where he would try to tell people what he was feeling. And to be honest, sometimes it worked but sometimes it didn't. And for those times, he had this little notebook and a pen. And when someone annoyed him, he would turn to a page in the notebook and punch holes in it. And then he would come to the session and he'd say, one boy not kicked, one girl's hair not pulled, one teacher not humiliated. And as the weeks went on, the pages were fewer and fewer. As he was able to put his feelings into words, he didn't have to hurt other people by showing them his hurt or he didn't have to show his hurt by hurting other people. We can't expect feelings that aren't addressed not to seep out in unhelpful ways. Um, and this is something I see quite a lot. The frustrated, the angry child will drive a teacher to the brink of frustration. The sad child will push and push and push her sibling until they cry. We have to help children express their emotions so that they don't seep out in these unhelpful ways. Now, once children are talking about their feelings and thinking about how to cope with them, 
The next step is to model problem solving. The most important lessons we learn are the ones we learn ourselves. We want to prepare our children for the road, not the road for the children. Independence doesn't begin when children leave home. It begins at home. Solving small problems in the early years helps children cope with bigger challenges in the later years. There's a reason we don't tie their shoes, even though it's faster when they're 10. <laughs> Honor your child's competence. Resist your overparenting urge to do their homework, write their personal statements, contact their future employers. Real parents are actually doing these things, and make no mistake, it is to the detriment of their children. Regulating emotions is challenging, lifelong work. It means taking responsibility for your feelings and making choices about your actions. It can be the difference between a calm life or a chaotic life. People who do it well have higher stress tolerance, lower anxiety, better social skills, and longer attention spans. They know what they feel and how to cope with it. We can't change what happens, but we can change the way we experience it. Help your child surf the waves of life by teaching them to mine the gap between feelings and action. Thank you.